Hi guys, welcome back to the Nevermind Poly podcast. My name is Matt, I'm your host, and we chat to rock and metal bands from around the world. And it's my absolute pleasure to bring you this episode with the fantastic rituals. I've got Lewis and Matt on the line. How are we doing, gents? How's things? Good, man. Good, good, good. Oh, good. Awesome. Yeah. Just, um, you know, lovely sunny evening. What more can you ask for? Absolutely, absolutely. And um, we were just discussing before we before we started recording that I've got a lot to talk to you guys about because you guys are pretty fresh faced off the back of your download performance. So I want to yeah. talk all about that and everything else. But firstly, I want to kind of I think it's really interesting to figure out and find out where people have come from, because although some people will have you believe that they're born into metal and, you know, their favorite uh, band when they're three years old as Cannibal Corpse, simply not the case. So I would like to know, gentlemen, if we can. Where does your kind of musical journey begin from? Was it friends, family? How did you kind of get into metal and playing and rock, rock and roll music? Matt, do you want to go first? Or? Yeah. Um, I mean, my, mine's a bit of a strange one, to be honest, because um, I've got two sisters, mm-hmm. um, one of which listened to um, Trance and the other one, uh, and Celine Dion, and the other one listened to like metal. Mm-hmm. So they li- they, in, in our parents' house, they live. And, and like one side and I was on the other side and I would just hear this weird combination of like metal Celine Dion and trance and some of it was I'm not really a, too much of a fan of Celine but like I really enjoyed like the uh the dance elements at first when I was when I was younger so I got into that first and then um my sister Sarah gave me a cassette with Injustice for All on it Amazing. That's a good start. Good start. <laughs> yeah, I started listening to that and I was like, yeah, this is great as well. And then um, I got into stuff like the Bloodhound Gang, um, which was like a combination of both, I guess. Mm. Um, and then it was the the heavier stuff when I discovered like it was Iowa when that came out. And I was really I was like, this is I think this is it. <laughs> when I discovered that, I was like, this is great. So yeah, I mean, I pretty much got my, my two sisters to thank for a very strange uh, music taste and um, a journey into like the heavier aspects of of metal, I guess. I love that. I, I love the idea of it of rituals potentially doing a Celine Dion trance heavy metal record. That that really that sounds like <laughs> I'm all about that. You know, I'm all about that. You heard it here for this. It's happening, Celine. If you're listening, no complaints on that. Like no complaints. <laughs> brilliant stuff how about you Liz how did you get into Um, rock and metal my music kind of like it's a the way I got brought up with my parents was that like my dad used to listen to like old like Dire Straits Boston um and then like my mum was in like Duran Duran yes Simply Red uh like sort of like level 42 like a bunch of like older like I suppose you could say like rock music essentially and then um like my earliest memories are like listening to like yes records in the car so from that, I just kind of went on YouTube and then I think it was the first thing I ever found that was heavy was the duality music video on, uh, on YouTube. And that was kind of like a bit like moment, like when Matt heard Iowa, I kind of heard that and I was like, ah, this is, uh, it's interesting. And then I went like down a rabbit hole of listening to like anything and everything, as long as I had like a drop tune guitar. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I didn't really kind of, there was no holds barred. Essentially, I kind of just listened to all sorts whilst also still listening to like neo soul music and like jazz and then i listen to like loads of like house and dnb as well so my music taste is just literally a bit of everything combined into like a a sort of an every everything pile and it's just i think that's one of the reasons our music as well is kind of got a bit of like a heavy twist with like all sorts of like melodic elements is because we're all influenced by so much i mean you and our guitar players are massive oasis and depeche mode fan and sure. like there's like there's so many things like all of us have so many different music tastes and so many upbringings of music that we bring to the table that kind of creates what we kind of like as a as a collective but um yeah like literally my earliest memories were just like loads of like loads of dire straits and loads of yes and i don't really think i can remember anything other than that Absolutely. And that's the thing. The bigger your pool of influences, the stuff you listen to, not so much that you bring to the band, but just in general knowledge of music, the better 
you know, you're about to draw from different things. Like, you know, it was like, I want to try this thing, but you don't quite know what you're aiming for, if that makes sense. So yeah. it's kind of like feel, feel, feeling where the box is, uh, has its edges and things. That's really cool. Yeah, um, I wanted to kind of uh, talk about as well. I'm going to start with, with you, Lewis. Where does your first kind of uh, singing kind of come from? Because obviously, um, without uh, blowing smoke or anything like that, you're a fucking brilliant band, you're, and you've got a lovely set of pipes. So where did that all kind of come from? Um, well, I couldn't sing uh, at all, like at all, when we first started the band. And me and Ewan were like, when we started the band, we're like, well, who's going to sing? And he was like, well, I'm not singing. I was like, I guess I'll sing. And yeah. uh, I mean, the original demos will never see the light of day and they will be burned at the stake. They are horrific. They were recorded in my old bedroom through a little microphone that interface. And I think it was more just like when I started singing, I was heavily into like Of Mice and Men, um, mm -hmm. a lot of like While She Sleeps, um, some like Architects, Bury Tomorrow. So I kind of like, I wanted to sound like people that I enjoyed listening to. For sure. um, but I didn't really know how to do so. So it was a lot of years of just like working like vocally. I mean, I couldn't scream before going into lockdown. Um, the screams that I used to do live were just me just literally yelling and it sounded horrific. Like when the fountain band was put, like first playing gigs. Um, and then went through lockdown. I essentially just practiced every day until I could do it and it didn't hurt anymore. Um, I get people ask me loads like, like about my technique and it's like it's it's it, i hate being asked that question people because i have no idea what i'm doing like i don't know what the technique is that i use i just know that it's like a very good like, compression based style of screaming and it's like it's it comes quite easy to us like, i'm not don't feel like i have to push to get the screams but i have no idea technique wise what's going on in my throat or diaphragm but yeah it was just a lot of um a lot of just working at it and doing it constantly and just a lot of recording myself and go, well, that sounds horrible, so I'll try it again. And then recording again, well, that sounds horrible, so I'll try it again. So it was literally just constant work to try and achieve a sound that I was after. I feel like I'm at a point now where I'm at a vocal point where I want to be, where I, where I wanted to be with my voice and with like um, sort of the heavier side of the vocals. But yeah, it was, there was no lessons, nor was there any kind of like birthed talent where I was born I could like wow I sound like you know this I just I sang until I thought it sounded good really and that's kind of the only thing I could say about it to be honest with you yeah that's that's perfectly fair and I think that's the thing as well obviously like I think there is a, a level of you know no matter how much um work you put in you know yeah. like you try like for I'll take I'll take a football analogy I'm not a big football guy right but Lionel Messi right he's obviously got raw talent yeah but there's fucking loads and loads and loads and loads of effort gone into that and, and training and everything else. But like him trying to then to teach someone how to do that thing, it's like, well, I don't fucking know. I just do it. Yeah. I just turn up and do this thing. So it makes makes yeah, perfect sense. Man. How about you? Um, how about you, Matt? How did you uh, first get into guitar playing and things like that? And when was your first uh, sort of picking guitars up? Well, I'm I'm the drummer, like so. Um... Yeah. <laughs> fucking fantastic. Sorry, I do apologize. Oh, let me rephrase that. Um, <laughs> Drums, the fucking beautiful drums. How did you first get into it? I do apologize. I don't know why I've done that. No, but no, it's all good. I should have continued that on, shouldn't I? And I should have been like, yeah, I was listening to like, Extreme and like in, in my bedroom. <laughs> it's like, and then I got my first guitar from a charity shop. No, um, <laughs> I, I tried guitar at first, I think. And I just, I was like, nah, it hurt my fingers. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, so I was just like, I'm not, I'm not a fan of this. Um, but I don't know, like, I think uh, from a drums point of view, I was kind of just naturally drawn um, to watching drummers when I, used, when I was going to gigs, when I was like a teenager. Um, and I was like incessantly tapping um, on everything and anything. Um, which and this was... hasn't stopped, by the way. We'll be in the van, we'll be tapping on absolutely everything. Like the man is a walking rhythm box. It doesn't end. No, no, it never ends um and i think it's like it's probably an insanity thing by this point but it's it's kind of um i don't know i think that i think it was my parents that sort of said you know you can hold a rhythm um so i was like oh well and i was i was i said are you would you be up for getting me a drum kit and i think they we got like a really cheap sort of drum kit and put it in our spare room um and i think i think the first song i ever learned how to play was 94 hours by Azalea Dying. Okay, um, yeah, nice. So I was just like, well, I mean, 
it's not the hardest song in the world, but it's not that easy. So, so I was like, maybe, I mean, the technique was terrible, but I used to just um, record things that somehow, I don't know how I got a tone from this, but I used to record drums with one USB microphone into what? my PC at the time. Um, and I used to send it to a friend on MSN Messenger who would put like riffs over it and things like that. Um, and then I just, I joined a, I joined a band, like a, like a metal covers band. Um, and then it's just entirely self-taught really. Mm -hmm. Um, I think I, I took, I did sign up to drum lessons at school once, but I had one lesson and then my drum teacher, when he was moving house, dropped a grand piano on his fingers and broke all his fingers. Um, so, so then, uh, I was like, oh, well, I'm not getting lessons anymore. Then I'm just going to teach myself. For sure. So, so that's kind of, that's how it's gone. And it's still learning. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I love that. And that's the thing. I think you should definitely take up the guitar now as well. Like, because you've clearly, clearly mastered the drums and the art of having the rhythm. So guitar is the next thing for you. <laughs> I can... I've got a video of Matt playing the guitar and singing a Limp Bizkit song. I can confirm the man needs to stick to drums. <laughs> I would, I would hold. Hard. I was going to bring that up actually. It's like I really poorly, poorly play. Um, take a look around by Limp Bizkit. Um, but I, I when, think... I, when you say poorly play, it's 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 an attack on the instrument. But it's great. It's it's a fantastic video. Yeah, it's it's, it's absolutely horrendous. I think I think there's a market for that though. I think people would pay to see like her horrifically played guitar, especially in that song. I think it's, I think it's nailed. Like me when you get it done. I mean, to be fair, there is there is arguments to be had that some bands do do that and get paid for it, but I'm not <laughs> saying that. But you know, anyway, yeah. <laughs> moving on. Um, since um, so you guys kind of formed as rituals uh, as kind of part of a college a uh, college college project. Have I got that right? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, can you talk me through how the early days were then in comparison to where you guys are now? Because you know, you guys have been very fucking busy in that time. Yeah, well, what happened is uh, Ewan, who, like, Ewan, our guitar player, writes, the, like, 95% of the music. Um, and, like, back, back, like, back in, like, 2018, Ewan would just sit at home and just play riffs and record and record and record. And we met in college in the 2017 um, mm -hmm. and just kind of, like, just got on. I'm pretty sure I just forced him to be my friend because he's the only guitar player at the college and i was like you're now my new friend and yeah, then we're kind of like pretty much inseparable from that point to be honest with you like we went to um he ended up, ended up going to bim in london now went over to newcastle college my final year of college and we uh when we were walking over the time bridge in like 2018 we were both in like this terrible band in college terrible terrible band in college yeah. and then we were like, why don't we just start a band? Because we're trying to trying to do stuff, but none of us, like, the people we were working with, not, no one would kind of do what we wanted to do. So we walked across the Tyne Bridge, and Ewan went, what about rituals for a band name? And I was like, that's meant to do that. So, like, there was no kind of, like, there was no, like, sit down with a pen and paper for a band name and for an idea. Ewan said, what about rituals? And then, literally, we put a band together. We used to rehearse in Edinburgh with, like, some of the older members, and it was a little bit of a pain having to travel from Newcastle to Edinburgh to rehearse, but we did that for about a year, played a couple of gigs around Newcastle, just kind of mucked about. There was nothing serious. Like we obviously we had the goals to like play a download and to tour and you know have like a fan base. And uh that was the goal. But we like we had no idea how to get there. We had no idea what needed to be done. So we just we had a laugh and like and the thing that I think is great with rituals is like no matter what we do now, we still have that. We still have a laugh. Everything's still fun. Like it might be the most stressful situation that we could be dealing with, but it's still fun. It's still a laugh. And like all four of us somehow still manage to keep each other like upright and keep each other going and keep each other happy because like it's still a laugh at all points. It's still the most fun we've ever had. But yeah, we literally just kind of like mucked about and then lockdown really, we went to lockdown. We weren't doing much. We weren't really kind of doing anything and, and we went to lockdown we been writing a song um and we put it out just around like week month like three or four of lockdown we kind of like got it recorded and did the drums like on like a uh, logic like program the drums in and we got a friend of ours to mix it and we put it out and people were just like really interested because i think we were the only band kind of putting out music at like an underground level because we had the access to do it all at home yeah for and, sure. um so we just kind of, we put a couple more songs out and we had a bit more interest. And then when we came out of lockdown, 
it was like, right, well, we need a full new lineup. We need a bass player. I was playing bass and singing at the time. So we were a three piece and we needed a new drummer and we needed a bass player. And I was just going to focus on singing. So it was like a no brainer getting Matt in the band, a no brainer getting Dom. Um, and I suppose it's kind of like corny to say, but the rest is literally history. Like we just, sure. just kind of, we just booked as many shows as we could started playing like as complete nobodies no one knew, knew who the hell we were and we were just getting in front of people we played our fair share of like gigs playing to the bar staff and all that kind of usual graft um and it's just been like non-stop like busy like, we try to tour as much as we can we try to get as many shows try to get um try to do as many things as we possibly could and um really pushed it to the limits of a, you know, for a band our size, you know, we, we're doing a hell of a lot, um, tiring ourselves out a lot, rehearsing like two, three times a week, trying to just take it as seriously as possible. And then with this whole Kerrang deal, I suppose it's had a little bit of like a, a knock on effect essentially. And it's the graph that we've put in, the work that we've put in and how passionate we are about it, how strong we feel about it. I think it's definitely kind of come through to the other end where we were, we were selected as this band to play a download and get this record deal. And, you know, I, we're, we're, we're proud to be that band, but it also makes sense to us because we've worked so hard for it. And like, I would, I would, I would arguably sit and say that we're probably one of the hardest working bands I know because it's just all we do and it's all we know. So kind of from like 2018 to now, the thing that's remained the same is the fun aspect and enjoying every second of it. But the thing that's changed is us learning how to work and how hard we should be working. Um, and the quality, I mean, the, the quality will naturally go up anyway if you're working hard at something, but it's definitely gone up with the addition of Matt and the addition of Dom because we've got more people bringing their pool of influences into the band now where it's like, it just, it's perfect. Like the, the recipe now for the band works so well and we're all like just best friends doing what we love doing. So it's like, it just works really well for us. Absolutely. And that, that's the thing as well. Um, I wanted to touch on, obviously I'm going to talk about the, the Kerrang deal. And that was the whole thing with this podcast. I didn't want it just to be the fact that you've done this thing and you've, you've yeah. done that because you're so much more than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like everyone's, because that's why, that's why I've done a lot of notes because they got to talk about the origin of the band and things and how you've got to where you are now. And that mm. comes, like I say, with a lot of fucking hard work, a lot yeah. of fucking worrying and all the rest of it. And, and you guys have been on been on tour with the likes of um, As Everything Unfolds and Skin Dread. And the one that really pricked my ear, right, was the Skin Dread one. Because yeah. Skin Dread are unfucking touchable live. They are yeah. just, you know, love them or hate them. I mean, I don't know anyone who hates Skin Dread. Like, I need to get their fucking brain tested because they're great. Yeah, really. <laughs> but how, how was that experience? And, um, you know, I think, I imagine it must be kind of like a hard thing, right? So... If you like, there's always like the big bands that talk about like Iron Maiden, right? No one wants to open for Maiden, right? Because they're just, the fans are notoriously like, fuck any support bands, we're here to see the main act, right? And I'm not saying Skindred are like that, but Skindred put on such a live experience that it's kind of like, kind of follow that, if that makes sense. But in the reverse, it's like, kind of people like, okay, we were here for this one thing. How did you find that experience? Um, Well, it's it's a funny one, because like when we we got that show with Skindred, we... Like, I think we'd convinced ourselves that we were going to play like 50 people. Like, we were convinced that no one was going to care about an opener. Like, so we're like, well, we'll play it to 50 people every sound. And I remember we were backstage and, and Benji actually came in mm-hmm. at like 10 past seven. We were on at half seven. And he was like, what are you doing in your dressing room? You need to get on stage now. And we're like, oh, shit. Like, we've annoyed the band. We're not on stage yet. So yeah. I went running out to the stage there was no one in the room I was like oh no we're gonna play it no one it's gonna be heartbreaking and I was like where's the lads like the lads aren't coming out where have they all gone and I, and I went backstage and Benji and the rest of Skin Ridden Rage and Speedhorn the main support band all yeah. just dying laughing and they were just like basically wanted to play a little prank on like on us which was great and we we loved it but I was like I was panicking at first but it was like we went on it at half past seven and right. I mean, but like I say, we thought we were going to play nobody. Mm. And there was like 900 people in the room. It was absolutely packed. Amazing. And it was like, for us, like it was the biggest show we'd ever played. So mm. we wanted to go up there and just kind of go, right, well, we're, the, we're, the, we're the locals on this show. We've got a point to prove. Um, yeah. but we also want to go up and enjoy all of it. And the crowd were absolutely amazing. Like, you know, we, we, we're, we're, we're definitely a different band now live um, compared to then. But at the time, you know, we're still... Pride ourselves as being a, you know, solid, solid live band and 
the the, the crowd's reception was absolutely fantastic. Um, literally couldn't have hoped for a better crowd. Um, it just was, it was class. Like there was mosh bits from the first song. Um, there was people singing along, which was like definitely become more of a mind blowing thing as like gigs have gone on. Like 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 for example when we did our hometown show and download, like hearing the actual crowd singing the songs back to us. And it was like, just that, that kind of atmosphere. And I think the Skindred show for us was a massive turning point because it was the biggest show we'd ever played. We never played to that capacity before, but when we did, our songs felt like they translated so much better at that level. But like these songs that Ewan's written that we're playing live, yeah. born to be played at this size and born to be played on tours that size and I think it was just an affirmation thing for us really when we played that show is it right we're, we're getting somewhere we need to just keep working and then the week after we're like right we need to work even harder and I think when we've had the opportunities being given it's never kind of made us go we need to sit back and relax it's always made us go right well now we need to step it up a gear so we need to work even harder than I've been working and I think that's that's probably a testament to the band we've never ever taken a seat back we've taken a bit of time off to just go right we need to relax but then yeah. always going right we're going to kick it in the gear and we're going to work harder um and yeah i'd, I'd say that's you know like when we had the as everything unfolds show you know um that itself as well like it was sold out and it was just mint and the atmosphere and vibe is just fantastic so but for, very very fortunate but it always shows us and you know when we get especially when you get to watch these bands when we get to watch skin it's the first time I've, i'd ever seen them and I was watching um, my favourite band side stage and I was like, this is absolutely world-class. And then we yeah. watched that, like, right, well, that's how it's done. So now we need to work a little bit harder to try and figure out how that is. But, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it really is. It's just been, like, it's been lessons, really. It's been lessons for us as a band as to how to be a better band and how to be le- a better live musicians and, and how to carry ourselves on stage um, in more of a professional and comfortable manner as well. Absolutely. Um, do you have anything to, anything to add to that, Matt? Or are you sort of happy summing that up like that? <laughs> yeah, I was absolutely spot on. Um, I've, you know, um, props to Skindred because they, for having us on that gig, because it really, really helped us. It mm. was only like one gig, but yeah. it really helped sort of cement like our our name in, in certainly Newcastle, but also it helped us out when trying to get shows um, across the country as well. Um you know, people start taking you a little bit more seriously when you played with with bigger names, and they they couldn't have been any more down to earth and uh, any more helpful. And to see them getting to play the levels that they're playing now, yeah, as well, you know, you know, they're touring with Kiss, the toured with All Beats, the the headline, the second stage of Download and stuff. You know, they've been as as a band, they've been grafting for years. Yeah, absolutely. And they've been doing well, but it's it's just great to see that guys that are so humble in what they do and so nice actually do really big things. So yeah, it was still one of my favorite ever shows. I'm pretty sure you can guess what the number one favorite show is, but like yeah, of course. My, my favorite second favorite show was going to be that skin red one it has to be. Yeah. Awesome stuff. I, I wanted to ask, do you guys, and it may seem like a redundant question, but some people aren't, some people are, do you kind of get nervous before playing a show? Like talk me through the sort of half an hour before you hit the stage. What's going on sort of physically, mentally? How are you feeling before you go on? Uh, it's actually a really good question. I think purely off what we've been doing recently as well. I mean, we did our hometown headline show like two weeks ago. Yeah. And prior to that, we did a 80 cap venue in Newcastle. Yeah. And so out and like we were we were excited and a bit nervous for that. But then this show was was 420 people. So like the step up was like huge for us. Um yeah. and like and collectively all of us were bricking it before that show. Like very, oh. very, very nervous because the difference between like playing shows and say like Manchester or Leeds to like mm-hmm. playing a town show where like you know you got your friends and family in the crowd, you've got like diehard like rituals fans in the room. It's yeah. like, you know, you've got to deliver just that. You know, you've got to deliver the same amount, but you, you're getting watched probably in a little bit of a stronger manner than you would have been at other shows. Um, and like for that one, like I remember us all sitting backstage and we were like all just silent, just kind of like, whoa, like we had like a big pre-show playlist on and we could hear that playing downstairs and we were all just kind of sitting in the dressing room like this is like mental, the atmosphere and like very, very nervous. But then I think like we skipped forward to download Mm. Um, and there was nerves there was like this nervous anticipation but then 
I, I know I know especially for myself when I was stood side stage waiting to go on it was like there was just nothing there was no nerves there was no like nervous energy it was just pure excitement it was just pure like it just ecstatic excitement to be like we're about to do this you know we've dreamed of doing this for years um and it was just this kind of like it was just like right well, where we're, where where we want to be or where we're meant to be right now and there was there was no nervous energy from me and especially walking on stage to the tent full of people and it was just kind of like there was just this massive just grin on my face and I was like this is sick this is this is just so cool but you know we all we, we all definitely we all definitely get nervous I think before every show as well like before no matter if we're playing 50 or 500 people we're all always still nervous um but I think there's just different levels to it and there's just different levels to the nerves and I think sometimes it's a little bit more for the different individual reasons but for me personally it was the headline show I was bricking it and then download and I was just like right get me on stage right now I'm sick of waiting get me on stage that's how I was feeling Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I wanted, uh, I'm going to give it a kind of a brief overview for people who might not be familiar with what the Krang the Deal is. So I've taken this sort of directly from the website, so just bear with me, gents. Um, okay. so the Krang Deal is basically a wicked competition that Krang have run for a number of years. Uh, and the winning band get the the winning band get the chance to play Downer Festival. They also get a record deal with Marshall Records to release a five-track EP, international marketing, all that thing through uh, through Marshall, and lots more. Um, obviously, hundreds of bands uh, get on the shortlist, gets whittled down by a massive panel. So uh, my first question is, who put forward the application? How did that kind of that conversation start? How did how did that all get going? You um, just did it on the bus, didn't he? Yeah, he, he was sat on the bus on the way to work and he just filled out the application form. Um, I mean, we, we we filled out all sorts of files and forms for like gig applications and you never hear back. You never, ever hear back. So we were just kind of like, oh, well, well, we'll fill it out and we'll go from there. Um, and we got the we got the email soon to being shortlisted out of like 800 bands, shortlisted to like 55. <laughs> I, phoned, I phoned Matt and I was like, this is stupid. Like, this is absolutely mental that we'd been like, shortlisted to that point but it was I mean it was a little bit of a whirlwind I mean like it was what like three weeks of waiting like once we got shortlisted and then we were in the studio when because the the shortlist was in a fan vote so we just we just hit the social media like crazy and we're like just just vote just no matter what you do just vote for us like it's it's just kind of like the, the, the biggest opportunity we could have for like living our dreams really and we did a lot of the, a lot of ideas to get people to vote, didn't we? I, I had a video of me cleaning me plant as, as an idea to get people to vote. I forgot about that. You know, and it, it's like we were just trying. We were like, right, we're really going to gun for this one um, because it's like it's so awesome. Like some some competitions, we're like, well, enter, we'll see what happens. But um, yeah, we're really really gunning for that one. Um, anyway, where were you? What we said. Well. It's literally, yeah, I mean, as you say, we were just we were gunning for a minute. It was like, it was just, we we were just, we, it was something that we wanted more than anything, but it was also like, if we don't get it, we're still being shortlisted, so we're still buzzing. Um, and to, to have been shortlisted as well, you know, have our names amongst the other bands that got shortlisted was mental. And then um, we were in the studio recording, we were literally recording the vocals for the single we've just put out. And yeah. we'd gotten an email saying we'd gotten through to the final 10 and like the, our, we'd got enough votes to get through. And we were just like, what on earth like it was insane to think yeah, like we're screaming and shouting weren't we in the studio yeah, and George was out there like whoa <laughs> yeah, was like, are you done yet we're like ah it's cool and mental um yeah. and then it was uh it was sophie k from mm-hmm. Quran that uh yeah. kind of said oh we're going to do it just a routine interview for you so yeah. me and matt on this interview and it was like 11 o'clock on a thursday morning i'm sure. sitting there just going to get asked a bunch of questions by like this insanely well-known, like fantastic presenter. And we we're like, this is going to be class, it's going to be a lot of fun. And yeah. we we're just sitting there, weren't we? We we're just kind of like chatting away to her and asking these like very, very normal questions. And she's like, I'm just asking all of the finalists these questions. We're like, ah, oh, six, eight. And then uh, she goes, ah, oh, actually, I forgot one question. Um, I'm just going to quickly ask you. And she was like, yeah, producer saying I've got time. And you're like, okay, so what would your reaction be if I told you right now that you were the band that won the deal? And what did you say about you? You were saying you went through your MacBook across the room. Yeah, I was like, well, you know, uh, yeah, I'd launched this MacBook across the room, this one that I'm talking about right now. Um, And she was like, well, leave your MacBook where it is, but um, I can't confirm and tell you that you're the band that I've won. And we were just like, 
incredible. They obviously orchestrated it in such a way that it just hit us both like a like oh. a sledgehammer. We were just like, "What on earth is going on?" Like, <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, I was sat right here. Yeah, I was in shock for a solid like forty eight hours afterwards. My mom came in the room. My mother was stood next to us, just crying her eyes out, and <laughs> I was just like, "What is going on, man?" It was just total like total shock. Like it couldn't have been delivered in a better way. Like the man it was delivered was fantastic, yeah. and it just took us by surprise. Really, we had we just no idea what was coming. Absolutely love that, and massive, massive uh, props to Sophie K for just being a fucking legend for years. Yeah. In terms oh, yeah. of stuff she does, absolute legend. Um, that that's such a good way to do. It. Was it? Was it? I'm assuming it was live on Kerrang Radio. Is that is that the case? It, it yeah. was. It was pre-recorded, so that she okay. just in case it's boring. <laughs> yeah. no, we like, didn't swear. I, I really don't know how I we didn't how we swear. Didn't. No. Like I don't understand how that. Like we've not had media training or anything, and we swear all the time. So I just don't know why we didn't. Uh-huh. Technically, we should be like, what the fuck. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, should be, we should be losing our minds. I think we're just both kind of like, um, totally okay. just like, yeah, no. you, it was like you wind us up. Is this like a joke or? <laughs> it was fun, like, and then yeah, we were literally like we had to hold on to the news for like a week, which was the most painstaking thing to do in the world. Just to not tell anyone. Yeah, and then it was like the following Friday. Um, I'd got in late from work, so I slept in past the announcement. Oh, and Matt, no. Matt messaged in the chat going like. Kerrang a post on us, download a post on us, why is no one awake? And I woke up, I was like, oh shit. I was like, oh, I'm gonna take away. I, I didn't know what was going on. Like, I was walking to work and I was listening to it on Kerrang Radio and the chat was dead, the band yeah. chat. I was just like, we were asleep. I just woke up and I just posted this photo to him with one with a caption and yeah. that was it. Our phones just went insane. I think it was like, there was just like a like and a comment like every 10 seconds. I had to turn my phone off completely because it was just like the entire phone was blowing up but all of us were just kind of like what is going on and then Dude, literally my phone got hot yeah like <laughs> from that day it's just been chaos like it's just been mental like everything that's kind of come our way and like the people we've met the opportunities we've been given and like the things we've been working on it's like every single moment me and me and matt keep looking at each other and doing the single time going, what is going on like mm-hmm. what is happening and like when we were at download, we he turned around the day we were going to play, and he was like, neither of us have said what is going on. And I was like, are we getting desensitized to this? He's like, no, I think we're still in shock, mate. I think <laughs> we're still just like learning how to process. But yeah, it's it's it genuinely has been the most like insane, like 12, 13 weeks. It's just been mental. Yeah, that, that's the thing. The only the only thing that I can liken that to is something from my own experience is so majority of the time I do the things the proper way with the podcast. I go through pre agencies and blah, blah blah, and like it's a lot of back and forth sometimes. And the, I will say this to everybody: if you ever get the opportunity, just take it. Just ask because yeah. the worst someone can do is say no, right? Yeah. So when I first um I got um Liam from Cansbats and I just DM'd him on Instagram. I was like, would you like to come on a podcast? Send. And like about 12 hours later, I got a reply. I literally was like, nah, fuck off. Like, for, first of all, fuck off for replying. <laughs> Secondly, yeah. fuck off for saying yes. And third, I can't sit on a fucking Zoom call with you. Turns out he was fucking amazing and really a yeah. nice chap. But do you know what I mean? It's one of those things. Yeah. It's like, uh, no, no, absolutely not. Cannot do this. You, you've, got, you've got Tim on business as well, right? Yeah, that was a bit mad. That that was um that was one that got sent through on a PR thing. And I was like, if I don't have Tim and business on, um then i'm not doing my job as a quote-unquote journalist because yeah. you know, that's a, a fucking massive thing and you know but yeah it was fucking incredible and like i say i get to sit and chat to people like yourself and have a fucking lovely time so it's great but um <laughs> wild say again sorry that's just wild like sitting there with liam from cancer Bats and just like yep yeah, sound just talking. But i know exactly what you mean like some of the people that we've spoken to since and like some of the people that like we uh, will have the opportunity to work with in the future, we've mm-hmm. been sat there. It's kind of like there's no way this is happening. This is not. This is not happening. But it, yeah. it, it, yeah, it, it really is the most surreal experience, mate. But we're completely blessed to be in this position, but also have such a huge support network because we do, we do feel at the moment like there's just this insane amount of support that we've like. That sometimes we're kind of sat in one of this is like a little bit overwhelming how much support we're getting, but it's amazing. It's fantastic. Absolutely. And that's the thing. It's, it's a testament to your hard work to build the foundation. And then, you know, you've just had a, an absolute springboard, which you totally, totally deserve, which is fucking awesome. 
I want to talk as well about with the Crown deal. Um, you guys have either had the opportunity or get the opportunity to sit down with um, with Ryan Richards of Funeral Friend, who works for Future History Management, who works for like Sleep Token Holding Absence, then like stuff like that. Either how was that Zoom call, or how are you sort of what are you expecting to get out of that? I don't know whether you've had it yet or not. So yeah, we, we have already um, already sat down with him and talked mm. with him times since then. Um, lovely guy, like. Yeah. Lovely, lovely guy. I mean, you were you're, you're like you're like a big fan as well, aren't you, Matt? This playing. Yeah, like he's um, he was a, like a really big influence for me. Funnily enough, the first time I saw them was when um, they opened for um, Iron Maiden. Amazing, nice. Yeah. And um, everyone hated them, and I kind of went in with this attitude of like, well, I'm going to hate them as well. Yeah. And then um, turns out that I absolutely loved them, and then. Um, followed them ever since but yeah like he he does a lot of like symbol accents and stuff and i think i've i've been influenced or copied a lot yeah. of um what what he's done so that was pretty surreal and that interview happened in amongst all of the chaos as well for sure so, like, it was not an interview sorry um it was a, a zoom call obviously um but it was kind of right in the middle of when everything was going on like we'd found out we would won we're playing download marshall and everything so yeah, that was the initial conversation, and we've uh, we spoke a bit since. Um, not that much recently, because he's been obviously super busy with a certain other band that are like uh, blowing up, <laughs> blowing up right now and selling out arenas really in well. two hours and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll get the chance to pick that up again at some point because he's yeah. a really nice guy and knows a heck of a lot. Absolutely. Um, I wanted to t touch on, obviously, the Download Festival performance, because obviously we touched a little bit on it, and I've got it in my notes, is just talk about Download, because I, I actually went to Download Festival this year, um, and I didn't manage to catch you guys, and the reason I didn't is because I couldn't get anywhere fucking near the tent. No matter how much I tried, I couldn't get anywhere near it. So, yeah, and congrats on well, that. That's pretty good. Um, to be fair, it was fucking hot. How was yeah. it for you guys? How was, how was the show? How was the whole build-up? How was everything with that? It's difficult to describe, really, other than, uh, like, I don't know, I suppose if you think about, like, when you imagine what it must be like playing download, because, mm. you know, everyone in bands has probably done that at some point. Um, it was everything that I'd, I'd imagined it, i dreamt it to be, and, like, so much more. Mm -hmm. um, it was just a totally surreal, like, mind-boggling experience to do that. Um, everything from just like driving around in our NACA transit van, like behind the main stage, um, getting taken to the stage, setting up, getting taken to our dressing room, and then finally um, walking out in front of that crowd and, and playing and, and seeing the tent fill up and everything. Just totally mad. It felt like the actual performance was over in about a minute. Yeah. 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 But we've got so many videos and everything to look back on, which proves that it was it was definitely 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it was just like absolute, absolutely crazy. But it was, yeah, it was just total, everything that you could have, that we could have imagined it to be and, and more. It was just so, and that's why it's the best show I've, yeah. we've all ever played. Yeah. It's just good. such a... So you know all of the all of the things like privilege and honor and experience will never ever ever forget it in a million years. No. Absolutely, love that. I mean it was it was the it was just the entire thing, man. I mean like Johnny Doom introducing us and like the crowd like we was seeing people in the crowd wearing like Newcastle tops and there was like people wearing like full like Greg's outfits and there was like I was just seeing like Rituals T-shirts all over in the crowd and like. And we had so many people that we knew who were at download and I was looking in the crowd and like seeing so many like good friends and like my parents were like right in the middle of the crowd at the back. Um, mm -hmm. It was just this mental, I mean, like when we walked out, I watched Matt walk out onto the kit and there was just like thousands of people just buzzing. And then we walked out and it was just like, yeah, man, it was just insane. Like there was, there's a point in the set during the new track where I get everyone to like put their hands in the air and do the whole like side to side thing. And I yeah. was like, in my head, I was like, if no one does this, I'm going to look like a proper prat. Yeah. And it was just like the entire tent, just front to back, just literally thousands of people doing it. And I was just kind of like stood there. I was like, I, I literally have lyrics to sing. 
And yeah. I just went, what the fuck? I was just like, this is <laughs> mental. It was just the most yeah. insane experience. And like, you know, we were on a quarter to one on a Saturday afternoon. Like everyone's hungover. Everyone's yeah. tired. The sun's like knocking people out. It's warm um, as hell. Well, class, yeah. was straight, class was straight from the past. Yeah, I mean, like one of the, one of the best bands on the planet are playing around the corner, and mm. we still had eight and a half thousand people in that tent, and it was like it was just it was an experience that none of us will ever, ever, ever forget. No matter what we're going to do, like no matter if we do, like you know, we ever get the chance to play main stage, I don't think the energy and the emotion will ever be forgotten. Like we'll never ever be forgotten. It was just so special. Yeah, and it was um, yeah. I mean, I, I came off stage and just cried into Matt's shoulder for about a minute. I was just <laughs> sobbing because I was like, that was just such an emotional build up for like yeah. the thirteen weeks, and it was yeah, man, it was it was really was something special. Absolutely, and then and then I started welling up as well because you you were welling up, and then that was quick. The that moment was quickly thwarted because a fly flew directly into my eye as I was trying to have a cry, and I was just like, ah, oh, what what the hell? And then I was like. And then it was all just sort of the focus was on that, but yeah, it, it was very, very, very emotional um, experience, um, and it was just for that many people to turn out on that day when there's so many other things going on was just mind bending. Absolutely. One one thing I, I must say, and I must give credit to, to Downer Festival and the bookers and promoters and things behind Downer Festival, it's a really, really young, fresh-faced, diverse lineup this year. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with the older bands who are who are you know, still kicking and still kicking ass, but yeah. it's really refreshing to see a really young, vibrant, uh, energized crowd, but also the people on stage were young and energized and full of beans. Do you know what I mean? So did you guys manage to catch any of the, the bands playing across the weekend or were you just there just for that and there to go somewhere else? Or what was the deal? I think I saw seven bands in total because yeah. I was either, that, I mean, I'm ginger. So like I was wearing fact 50 every single minute of every day and I was yeah. diving for all the shade I could get hold of. <laughs> and by the Sunday, I was I was dead. I was dead to the world. Like I'd been knocked out by the sun, knocked yeah. out by the show. Like I'd met some of my like I'm like I'm a huge Polaris fan. Like mm-hmm. I love Polaris, and I got to meet all of Polaris backstage. And I was like, what is going on? I went went and got dinner with Jamie from Polaris. I was chatting on him for ages, and my entire brain was on overload. Was like, what is happening? What is happening? <laughs> and then uh, yeah, I mean, I I caught I saw Pendulum, um, Bring the Horizon. Absolutely amazing architects. Amazing. Lots. Like I saw, I saw, I saw like the, the headliners and stuff like that, and I saw a few other bands. Come on, catch Graphic Nature as well on the Dog Tooth stage, who are fantastic new bands. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really catch that many, but from the lineup, it's so good to see such a refreshing lineup as well. Absolutely. So Did you manage to see much, Matt? Or yeah, I mean, like Lewis, I think there was not that many because we were like pretty busy. Um, yeah. We. Yeah. We uh, got delayed getting in on the Friday, so we, we managed to get to at the spot for just as Metallica started. Uh, so okay, sure. We watched all of Metallica. Then the next day, um, yeah, so there was was Graphic Nature on the Friday? Yeah, they were on the Sunday. Oh, the Sunday. Um, I, I caught um, Comte de Brut. They, <laughs> they were absolutely phenomenal as usual. Um, architects, Bring Me the Horizon, um, but my like my shoulders had gotten nuked by the sun that day. I think I'd just forgotten to do that with the sun lotion, and I was wearing a vest. So yeah, um, everywhere yeah, else, was, everywhere else was fine on my body, but my shoulders were just like totally like well done. Um, <laughs> but yeah, caught both Metallica sets. Um, Slipknot were were really loud and amazing. Um, but yeah, it was just like. It was just such a, like you say, though, like great diverse lineup, um, and I really hope that's the way it's sort of, sort of headed, because, um, whilst some say like the older, older guys do it best, they're not going to be around forever. No, so absolutely. the fact that they've taken a punt on Bring Me the Horizon, even though they're a massive band, they've yeah. taken a punt on them to headline in between Metallica was a quite a risky choice. But someone's got to do it. You know, I've followed Bring Me the Horizon since like 2008, 2009, and I think they they should have done it 10 years ago. But that's besides the point. The fact they've done it and they fucking smashed out of the park as well. And, so you know, we, we, we all love, you know, um, Metallica and Sabbath and Maiden and whoever else you want to throw into that into that headline slot. 
but the truth is we all we all like die eventually do you know what i mean they're not going to be around forever and you know the festival needs to kind of adapt with the times and this is kind of the first real year that i've seen at least where they've gone cool we're just going to throw a shitload of interesting cool diverse new bands at you and yep. you know they sold out so do you know what i mean yeah. it obviously done Probably. something like whatever yeah. concoction they made it worked so you know fair play to them i think even, even with Bring Me, I mean, for me, I thought Bring Me the best headline of the weekend for me personally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really great. Performance, everything. I think it just had the balance and, you know, like brought a lot of guests and I thought they were just like unbeatable. Like unbeatable. Yeah, I was, I really was but like, you know, Sipnot's also one of my favorite bands on planet and I thought they blew Sipnot out of the water, but that is up for debate and conversation for everyone. But um, yeah. No, it was phenomenal, amazing, amazing festival. Also, the first time I'd ever been as well, so I didn't really know what to expect. And um, um, it was, yeah, it was special. It was well, well good. Absolutely love that. Um, you guys are on tour as well, or you're going to be on tour. So this is going out tomorrow. So normally I've got post on a Monday and a Friday. So we're doing it now. It's going out tomorrow morning. Um, so this coming Thursday, you're playing in Hull. And yeah. then it's Sunderland, Glasgow, Manchester. You've also got some dates in July, which are at Nottingham, Leicester, London, and Middlesbrough. And then a co-headline mm. tour in August with Archives. How's the mm. tour prep going? How are you feeling ahead of the shows? Um, very excited to go to Ireland. Very, very excited. Um, very excited to play a headline show in London. Um, I mean, like on our Spotify, like our biggest city is London. So we're nice. very excited. It's, uh, it's nice just to be getting out on the road and playing some shows and kind of, blow off some of the cobwebs, you know, post download and go to a lot of cities that people have been asking for us to come back to for a while, but also going to cities that when we go to, it's always mint. Um, and yeah. we always thoroughly, thoroughly enjoy to where it's always mint. We always get to the end of the end of the run and we're like, right, we don't want to go home. But oh, yeah, yeah it's going to be a lot of fun. Really excited, especially this week as well. I mean, whole last time we played, it was one of the most dangerous shows I think I've ever played. That venue's insane. I spent the entire show just like security, keeping everyone from falling on the pedal boards. Um, <laughs> Sunderland sold out now, nice. um, and then Glasgow. We know a headline in Glasgow, but last time we played up there was it was absolutely rammed. So it's it's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of fun. We're very excited. Yeah, and we've been in a bit of a loose end since download. To be honest, mm. we're kind of being like, well, that was the greatest show ever. Like, don't really want to stop. So it's really, I'm really pleased that we've got this run of shows coming up this week. Um, so we can kind of just get back out there and and do it again. I think if we had to wait until July for shows, um, it would have been dangerous. One of us would go insane, if not all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And besides, you you needed you needed a moment to get your arms back to rest after you've absolutely fucking cru- crucified them down for the sounds of it, mate. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm I'm still like I'm still shedding. It's it's really it's really weird. Like it's I'm not. Fire. <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing that again like that was awful <laughs> just one strip on each yeah. side but it's like i don't know it was horrible yeah lovely stuff um i've got a couple of final questions before i let you on your way and i do thank you for your time because i've kept you uh for 48 minutes so far and i hope you've enjoyed it it's been a pleasure for me um so we've obviously toured around the corner i wanted to so in 2023 i'm asking every band to give me one thing that I'd like to add to the Nevermind Polly podcast, Dream Rider, right? So when I'm a multi-fucking billionaire podcaster and I can have all the money and I can make my own festival and you guys are invited um, to play the show, I'd like to know one thing each that you'd like to add to the Dream Rider. Now, the rule is very simple. You have no financial restriction on what you can have. There's no logistical restriction on what you can have. You can have whatever your heart desires, right? I'll give you a little bit of context for this. We've had people say they want like saunas, like jacuzzis, fucking different style. Like I had one particular band want a particular French bottle of wine that's from like their home region. Um, we had Matt from August Burns Road who wants a full like monster truck set up. You can have whatever you want. What are we picking? Um, my one first. You go first, Matt, because I already know mine. Yeah, you go because you know I'm, I'm so excited right now. Like I, just, I need to, I need to be careful about this because if it happens, then <laughs> my my mine might sound very very boring purely because I really want to try it and I've never had it before and I don't know how to get hold of it. I don't know where you buy it from and I'm pretty sure you can't buy it in the UK. Is Monstera deliciosa, which is a fruit from a Monstera plant, and I've you can only eat, 
Oh. You can only eat it when it's fully ripened because if you peel the casein on the outside off, it's bitter and it burns your tongue. But apparently when it's fully ripe, it tastes like bananas, strawberries, peaches, and apples, and like cherries. It's like the, the nicest, sweetest, best tasting fruit in the world. So I want like 40 fully ripe Monstera Deliciosas to myself, and that's it. <laughs> I love that. That's such a fucking rogue shout. I love it. That's amazing. <laughs> Get in. How about you, Matt? <laughs> um, I, don't, I don't know. Like, I, I think I would probably want someone to recreate the set of um, early Takeshi's Castle. And um, I want Craig Charles there to narrate it. See, the thing is, right? you, you do the whole thing. Yeah, I exactly. Love, I love this question. Not to blow smoke away. I love because if you buy into it, the better it is. But if you were to come and go, oh, I just want some wine. It's like, okay, cool. But the more you buy into it, the better the answer. Fucking love it. Both of those gents. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Amazing. Um, I've got a couple of final questions. And the first of which is always a hard question to answer. I, I know, and I do apologize. What is ahead for 2023 for Rituals? Lots of writing, lots of uh, working with some very specific kick-ass musicians that we've been given an opportunity to work with um, and plans to do this year times 500 next year. Nice, nice. Basically, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Try and kick the living shit out of 2024 and like Europe, we're going to fucking do it. We're going to figure it out. We're going to do it. Ireland again. Like, just, it, it just, there's nothing, no holds barred, really. We're just going to do everything we can, but just going to kick this shit out of here. And, like, ideally, we'll leave in the June and not come back until September. And we'll just play hundreds of shows in loads of random places and it'll be sick. But yeah, lots of new cool shit and lots of cool opportunities to work with some uh, pretty mental musicians, really. And I think that's, the easiest way we could describe it without giving away too much. Lovely stuff. Lovely stuff. I, I like that you've already got the media training down to a T because no one tells they get well carried away and say something. Oh shit, let's edit that. And I'm like, I don't edit this podcast. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <said>. <laughs> cool. um, I have one, one final question. And it's a question I've asked every single uh, artist and band is gracious to give me their time. Like you good gentlemen. And that is simply what is the best thing about being in a band in your opinion? It can be something really simple. It can be something really profound, but it's what, what in your opinion, is the best thing? Um, doing my favorite thing with my favorite people. Lovely stuff. How about you, Matt? Yeah, absolutely that. Um, but also there isn't, there isn't a, uh, anything, a drug or anything on the planet that could get you quite as high as like performing in front of um, an audience that are yeah. into your music and the the better the shows get not necessarily bigger because some of the best shows are are quite small the yeah. better the shows get you know you get a better high from that and then you can't match that until you do it better than that so yeah. it's it's kind of that's that's the thing it's like the the adrenaline and the it's it's just the definition of sort of feeling alive essentially is the only thing i can i can put it down to it's the only time yeah. i really truly feel alive some people drive sports cars at 150 mile an hour um it's like with us being on that stage and it's you know when you just turn around and see the look on everyone's face it's just nothing can match it no, lovely, stuff. lovely stuff gentlemen is there anything that i've missed anything you want to plug anything you need to say at the end and then we'll get you going on your way um i think the only thing we really add on the end is just a massive thank you to karang and marshall records really for putting us in this position and a massive thank you to our like incredible support network and fan base who are the reason we are doing what we're doing so thank you lovely stuff awesome. and uh living blind our latest single came out um a couple of weeks ago um so if you're not heard it yet turn it up see what you think yeah. let us know you've you've sat <laughs> 55 minutes of this podcast and not checked out the new single what the fuck are you doing with your life anyway right. <laughs> gentlemen thank you so much enjoy the rest of your monday uh, i hope is um is as good as the start of this year has been for you guys because you fucking deserve it peace Legendary. out we'll see you soon yes, yes. thank you very much <laughs>